Well, Grand Rising, everyone. Yeah, that's our theme for the year, Grand Rising. It's a wonderful Caribbean term that uh, refers to the... Really, it's, it's more than good morning. It's more than hanging out and, and uh, showing up and g giving a casual hello. It's about really wanting to start your day with power and with presence. And so we're looking at that idea of really stepping into our power and our presence all year long with all these great um, topics. And the theme for uh, this week, I'm on that creaky board, I'm going to move back. <laughs> the, pop, the, the, the topic for the month of June, as Reverend Carla shared, is holy boldness. And um, today, I want to talk to you about sacred audacity. Now, I have said before, once or twice, that audacity is the mother of creativity. That it takes audacity to really begin to step into and to take ownership for the things that we create in the world. Now, mind you, we co-create it with spirit. There's a power and a presence that is greater than we are, that we can use, but we are, if you will, the midwives for all that we create in our lives and in the world. And so I'm excited to look at this idea of, of um, sacred audacity. I did want to just remind you of a couple of things. Today is our first Sunday of the month. We have a wonderful potluck, and so I hope you'll stick around for that. Bidding on our gourmets for God, today is the last day. So if there's something, oh, I heard that, ooh. <laughs> so if there's something that you really want to participate in, you, want, you might want to check your bids today because we'll be um, pulling all those bid sheets before we get started with. The next thing that's going to be start happening is the first Sunday of every month, we're going to treat you to a sound bath. Anybody here done a sound bath before? Yeah, if you hadn't, you might want to stick around and check it out. It's really an awesome opportunity to allow the power of sound to move through your body temple in a way that is very healing and grounding, and we'll be doing that uh, this morning after the potluck. And so it's a, you know, it's, this is our new um, jam on the first Sunday, and so it's a great Sunday to bring a friend. It's a great Sunday to introduce our community to other people. We have lots of gifts to give people on the first Sunday with our new offerings. So I'm really excited to experience the, the sound bath with Tamsin and her beloved. Oh, so where was I? Right, audacity is the mother of creativity. Audacity is the mother of creativity. That is, that is what I'm talking about today. There's this idea that boldness and audacity is the, almost the liftoff that we need to get through our inertia, to get through our attachment to sameness so that we can step into newness. There's a, a lot going on in the world. And I know, I say that a lot, but there is a lot going on in the world. <laughs> it's, it, this week was, was quite a week. There was a number of things that caught my attention. Now, I don't, I don't watch the news, but I try to keep myself uh, connected. You know, I have different news sources and things that bubble up for me. And I, I noticed um, that, uh, well, be. <laughs> This wasn't in the news enough, I'll say this, that this is Pride Month. Are you aware of that? So, so where I come from in Baltimore, we do a parade down Main Street <laughs> where we invite people to really step up and to take pride in the way they love. Um, I remember coming here to Orange County and I'm like, so when's the parade? <laughs> It's like we can we can set up a booth or something, you know. We can. It's a way to touch the LBGT community, and I was told I'd have to go to Long Beach for that. So, <laughs> so, but we celebrated in our, on our in our own way, just by being open and being available to to people, regardless of how they love. 
And so happy Pride Month. The other things that um, were in the news, there was a, a, a speech at Brandeis by Ken Burns, the historian, that I found quite powerful. And at the same time, it was a little, it ruffled some feathers. And then there was a trial verdict that happened. And depending upon who you are, you're either really disappointed or you're really excited. And what I know is that this is a community where we rise above our politics and stand in love. And I was really reminded of it this week when I heard the news, I was talking to my sister, and of course my sister and I have similar politics, so we were talking about the, the results, and, and then I started to uh, have a conversation, you know, just like you, everybody was talking about it, I wanted to be in on it, whatever, whatever everybody's doing, I want to be in on it, right? And so I went to talk to somebody else about it, um, somebody I love very much, and I forgot that our ideas are a little different. You know, I was kind of carried away, and I had forgotten that. But I, I love this person, and the fact is that this person really loves me. And so while it was just a tad bit awkward, there, there was no rife, there was no fighting, there was no, you know, my way, no my way, what's right, what's wrong. I think that we just, because Love was, is the primary ingredient in our relationship because we see each other as human beings, because we respect each other's humanity. We were able to go to that higher place. So I don't know about you, but this, this uh, train we're on in our country, it, it feels to me very much like a train wreck and everybody wants to take a look at it, and some of us are vying for different cars on the train. And it, it's, it's, it's hurtful, you know? And I'm really grateful for that conversation where I walked in and I, with my, you know, just wanting to be part of the crowd, and, and it, it made me think, and it made me step back, and it made me really look at what's important, you know? What's important to me is that we love each other and see each other for who we are beyond our opinions, beyond our, our outlook, beyond the things that we think, you know, are in the group think, if you will. For me, I have to remember that relationships and love is the single thing that really guides me. And so therefore, I have to be audacious and bold enough to get over myself. I get, get over my opinions and be willing to step back and remember what's important. I, I, I really, you know, I don't know how we are going to move through this because, you know, if you've noticed, science of mind and the new thought community is a pretty small footprint in our country. I, I, um, so I was, I was in a salon earlier this week and the television was on and there was some crazy series about people who, um, it's kind of a reality series about, I'm not going to talk about what it was about, except that there was this, the way people treated each other on TV. Like, why? Why do we do that? Why do, how, do we, how do we possibly forget the beauty and the magnificence of being alive for our petty differences. How is it that we are distracted so easily? I, um, as I looked at this topic of sacred audacity, I was reminded about the boldness that it takes to be authentic, to be authentic with who you are, now, I'm, I know I've just talked about how we want to be mindful of people's opinions and to, be a, and to love each other through them when, they're, when our opinions are different. And at the same time, we need to honor who we are and we need to be audacious in order to be part of the co-creation, to be part of creating a world that works for everyone. 
That is our global vision, a world that works for all. And sometimes I wonder if we think that global vision is a world that works for me, and gee, I hope it works out for you too. Right? world that works for me, and I hope it works for you. In order for us, as a philosophy, to stand in a place of wanting to create a world that works for all, we have to be willing to think. We have to be willing to check our beliefs. We have to be willing to look at those places where we get distracted from the deepest, deepest root of our truth, that we are one with each other. We have this wonderful philosophy that teaches us that spirit descends into matter as our experience and form. And the way that it does it is it moves through us. God cannot be present unless it comes through you. God cannot create unless it creates through you. And so that means that there's this whole plethora of things that I have experienced in the world as I've, you know, in the 62 years I've been on the planet, that, that God has to filter itself through. And so this, this, the, one of the things I really love about this philosophy is that it is a call for me, a clarion call, if you will, to be transparent, to really pay attention when I forget, to, when I get, you know, something happens like Thursday and I get spun up in trite things and I forget the deeper truth about who I am and who I've come here to be. I know without a shadow of doubt in my clearest moment that I have come here to be a conduit of love. Amen. And I have to continue to remember that. And I have to continue to look at those places where it's, it's kind of seductive to get caught up in the social dribble of things, the group think, if you will. You know, there's that part of us I talked about it, I guess it was last week I talked about, or maybe a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how important it is to belong and to really feel like we belong. And so I want to I invite us to be audacious enough to recognize that we can belong without making someone else wrong. That we can belong to each other when we remember the love that lives within inside of us, that, 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 that not just lives inside of us, that it created each one of us. That every spark of all creation comes through love, comes through this manifestation we call the beautiful song, we are a miracle. Life is a miracle. It is a beautiful gift that be, that's been given to us. And we get caught up. Oh, I, let's see. My daughter had to be 13 years old. She was in middle school. And um, I had this experience with her where I remembered how, uh, or, or became more conscious of how caught up I am in what I'll call social norms. You know, we have those, right? We have those social norms, the things that somehow we think are important, the ways that we have to be. I, I, way before that, I remember being a, a, a young person, and I had this simplistic idea that, you know, somebody made up all the rules, and they've been, it's been this way forever, and we just have to follow the rules. That's a crazy idea, and I, and I actually remember the point as a, as a young adult when I recognize that we're just making this stuff up as we go along. <laughs> we're just trying to do the best we can to create peace and order and a system that we can work with to, to try to create a, a sense of um, power and agency in a world that sometimes feels out of control. So there was this time when my daughter was coming home from school and I was coming out to my car and she was, we had this really long driveway and she was walking up the driveway and I remember looking at her and thinking, gosh, she, look, what's, she looks different, what's going on? And as she got closer, I realized that she had shaved her head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
except for two little strands of hair at the front. <laughs> Unfortunately, my reaction was not very loving. <laughs> I was really upset with her, and I said some things I regret to this day. And then I, the, the, a couple days later, I was taking her to school, and as I dropped her off, she hopped out of the car, and I watched all the other children hopping out of their car. They all had ponytails, jeans, and little polo shirts. And there was my daughter in her black baggy clothes with no hair, <laughs> walking in as confidently as these other individuals. And I thought to myself, wow, that took courage. That took a lot of courage to do something that was important to her. Later on, I then recalled that I had taken her to the Washington Mall where the Dalai Lama had spoken a couple of months earlier, and she was really captivated by the nuns and the monks, who are hairless. And I tell you this story because we have these snap judgments, right? We think that this is right and that is wrong. This is how it should be. It should never be like this. But it isn't until we pause and look at what is before us, that we can begin to piece together the whole story. If our culture, our nation, is going to come back together, we're going to have to do a lot of pausing. We're going to have to do a lot of looking. We're going to have to look within ourselves to find that place. There's a wonderful Rumi line about, you know, in the field of right and wrong, I'll meet you in the, in the middle. There is a place where we are all one, where there is no sense of otherness. And that oneness individuates itself in many ways. And while the things that we have a sense of, the societal norms that we walk around with, as, you know, as important as they seem to be to us, if we continue to be closed-minded and attached to what is, how are we ever going to change? How are we ever going to make room for the power of audacity to create something different? Um, I'm going to give you the definition of audacity, because I think, I think sometimes it has a real negative connotation. Sometimes when you, when you say somebody was, that they had a lot of audacity, you're really not saying anything nice. But audacity really talks about being, um, the definition as a noun is boldness and daring, especially with confident and, and um, well, Arrogant disregard for personal safety. <laughs> yes, I, 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 I'm not, like, I can hear it next week. Reverend Alice told us to be, like, arrogant disregard for our personal safety. What the hell? <laughs> but I'm not. But, and, and maybe we could soften that to a disregard for the, social, the societal norms that we have so that we can step into a powerful place of creation. That this thing called sacred audacity is the beautiful marriage of our amazing individuated selves who have each come here to be authentic creations coupled with the power of the presence, the presence that moves through each one of us, the presence that created you with blue or brown or hazel eyes, that created you with different textures and different skin colors and different ways of loving in the world. It's not a mistake. Every beautiful manifestation of the One is perfect. You are perfect, exactly as you are. So be audacious enough to honor and love and stand in who you are and look for that sweet spot where we can be together as one, where we can see each other's humanity, where we can move through life loving each other 
as a priority. I was, um, as many of you know, one of my favorite uh, authors is Richard Rohr. And Richard Rohr does a daily meditation, and he talks a lot about contemplation. And so uh, this morning's reading I thought was really perfect. He, t he talks about science, and he talks about change, and he talks about power. So let me read this to you. He starts saying that neurosurgeon Eben Alexander writes, true thought is not the brain's affair. But we have, in part, by the brain itself, we have, in part, by the brain itself, been so trained to associate our brains with what we think and who we are that we have lost the ability to realize that we are at all times much more. I remember when somebody told me, you are not your mind. It was a little mind-blowing the first time I heard it. And that's what he's talking about here. He says, in this moment, in every moment, we are much more than our physical brain and our physical body. True thought is pre-physical. This is the thinking behind the thinking, the consciousness behind our small ability to plug into it. If we stay at the, horizon, the horizontal level of calculating, judging, and labeling, we won't plug into it very well because we don't really believe in it. Many of us don't really believe there's anything spiritual beyond this material body. I think those of us in the West have probably been influenced by the materialistic worldview more than we realize. But Alexander and other scientists are coming to the recognition that there's something more. The recognition that the real power is in spirit. It is in the capacity for relationship, for connectedness, for, for being mirrored, and therefore gaining the ability to mirror other people. This type of thinking isn't dependent on linear deduction. It moves as fast as lightning, making connections on different levels. It might be hard to verbalize, but its experience is a moment of insight, a spontaneous gift of compassion, inner clarity. It will never be angry or violent, only a clarity of love. And in the face of this free inner intelligence, our ordinary thought is hopelessly slow and fumbling. It's the free thinking that comes up with the radical insight or writes the inspired song. Handel composed the entire Messiah score in less than a month. Clearly, he was in the flow. I hope we've all had moments when we're inside of grace, inside of love, inside of communion. To revert to negative, resentful thinking is simply five steps backwards. And yet we do it. Of course, we have to return to the face of injustice, the evil, the stupidity, and the oppression present on this earth. Yet I believe that we'll have the clarity, the calmness, and the grace, and the freedom to do it better than we've ever done it before. We won't respond to the urgency in angry or dualistic ways, and that makes all the difference. So Richard's who happens to have, he's, he's not a, he's not a uh, religious scientist. He's not a new thoughter. He's a Franciscan monk. And he's saying the same thing we're saying, that there is something greater than this material plane that we experience in the daily and the everyday. And so my invitation to you is to be audacious to look past what you think you see right in front of you and to check and pause with your heart and to always lean towards love and love of each other and love of the spirit that individuates as each one of us. Thank you very much. And so let's do a prayer. This is our form of 
the form of affirmative prayer. And so I start this prayer by saying, I declare that this community is a safe place, a safe place for the individual to stand in their truth and to be loved for who they are. And so I know the presence and the power of the one mind, the one heart, the one intelligence moves in, as, and through each one of us. That this thing that we yearn for, this peace, this order, this, this greater understanding, that all of that comes through our connection with our consciousness, our weeding out and cultivating our ideas, our beliefs, and our thoughts, and our willingness to meet each other exactly where we are as we are and who we are. And so I trust that this, this audacious idea of letting go of extreme ideas of right and wrong and coming to that place of seeing the humanity in each other is filled with grace. It's filled with with ease, and while it may not seem simple, there is a divine support that moves through each one of us who says yes to wholeness, yes to oneness, yes to love. And every time we choose that, a miracle happens. Some of them are small and some of them are mighty. And so I simply surrender myself to this process knowing that divine providence always flows through each one of us as we move through our day. We just have to be available to it. And so I am grateful for each one who has said yes, yes to this principled way of life, yes to love, yes to being audacious and being part of creating a greater yet to be for ourselves, for each other, for all. And so I simply anchor this prayer in deep gratitude for our inner yes, for our outer yes, and for all that will unfold. I simply say thank you and thank you and thank you again. And it is with a joyful heart that I anchor this prayer. And I ask you to anchor it with me by saying, and so it is. <laughs>